Hello, everybody. I'm John Brewer, and uh, I live in Denver, Colorado. I used to live in the Santa Monica Canyon. I grew up down there in the 1960s and spent a lot of time uh, mucking around in up and down the canyons uh, through Malibu, Topanga, and all that uh, on the beaches, surfing, doing this and that. Went to Pali High, uh, went to um, Paul Revere Junior High School, and so. My heart is still in California, even though I'm in Denver. I just gaze out the window right now, and there are the Rocky Mountains, and over the edge of the Rocky Mountains are you guys. So, um, and uh, I became interested in this subject of Paul Dubuclar, and it's been it's pronounced Dubuclar, um, even though it looks different. I've been saying it wrong for months now, and I'm so used to saying it wrong that you will catch me saying Dubasclard, but just ignore that because it's okay. I'm, I'm human. So um, anyway, the reason I got involved in this and interested was that I was searching for a Christmas, Christmas present for my brother uh, last year, and I was putting together a little historical, a little box full of postcards and things like that. He loves history, especially Santa Monica and the coast and all this. And so I was finding some different cards and I happened to spot, um, uh, one of Paul Dubuclard, Dubuclard's um, pieces, a, a, a postcard from Santa Monica called The Canon. And it was intriguing because of the quality of the work, the fact that it was a, a, a serograph, an actual silk screen piece that was handmade. Um, and so I saw one and then I found another and then I started poking around on eBay and various places and one by one, I started pulling these out. And the more I looked, the more I found. And there are many beautiful pieces out there that he made, uh, predominantly in the serographs and postcards, but in other mediums as well. So that's kind of how I got involved in this. It just became intriguing that this man um, had, had, had this fantastic background, which you'll hear in a moment. Um, and um, and then as a great artist and a great mechanical engineer. And so I started putting together um, a book on it. And um, uh, the book that I'm writing is called Along the Malibu, the Color Serographs of Paul P.M. Dubasclard, um, a catalog raisonné. And uh, I'm pretty much closing in on done with it, but uh, I anticipate that out of more discussions and events like this, that people will start to send me more information. But anyway, um, so um, let me just go into the first piece here. So Paul Dubuclar was born in Paris, France in 1892. Um, and we don't know really almost anything about, we don't know anything about his childhood. We know that he grew up in Paris and that he uh, went to the Sorbonne University uh, when he turned 18, um, and he spent, uh, you know, until 1913, at which point he graduated, and he graduated with two degrees, one degree in mechanical engineering, and one degree in applied physics, mm -hmm. um, and so immediately after uh, he graduates from school, or within the next half year or so, um, the World War I starts and he joins the military. We don't know what branch, the French military. And he is uh, injured in battle. He's shot in, in combat and with su significant wounds to his legs. Uh, he's captured by the Germans and he is taken into a prisoner, a German prisoner of war camp uh, where he was determined to have these great uh, skills as a linguist. He actually, at that time, had five or six languages, and so he could, they used him for interpreting, um, and he had, you know, French and Italian and English and German and Greek and uh, some others, um, and, uh, and so he was put to use uh, in, in the camp, um, and then also while he was there, he had some significant artistic skill, and he uh, decided to or somehow got involved in teaching art to prisoners. And so during the time he was there, he spent quite a bit of time with, uh, well, from what I understand is, uh, uh, is 
French and Italian uh, prisoners uh, teaching art. And we know from um, uh, his daughter's information and some information that he provided that during the war he made, World War I, he made a small uh, scale model of a, an American Conestoga wagon that was extremely detailed, about 10 inches long. And, and several people remarked on it in the documentation that we have. And it was saved, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it came out of the war. Um, so after the war ends, Paul um, marries uh, a woman, um, Olga, and, uh, and he immediately after marrying Olga, who it appears was a literature student at the Sorbonne, and maybe we assume that he met her during his, his pre-war time there, but it may have been afterwards, a little hard to say, um, but they get married. And then they, um, this ship that you see, this is the actual ship that he and his wife came to New York on in 1919. Um, and this is a postcard that I found on eBay. And it's just such a beautiful thing. I thought it was appropriate. Um, so he comes to New York City and he moves to Brooklyn and he lives in Brooklyn until about 1929. And during that period of time, he works for several different companies advancing in the ranks of mechanical engineering. We don't, we know what the companies are. Um, we don't know specifically what he did exactly, um, but there's records, uh, US government records that show his participation with these companies. And, um, um, and so in 1933, he um, and his wife moved to, um, uh, Minnesota, where he goes to work sequentially for two different companies, also in mechanical engineering. And then he, um, he uh, moves back to New York City in 1933. And he uh, is now being employed by a company called For the Farnham Company. And, uh, and, and then there's a, a, a subsidiary called Paragon that he uh, uh, is ultimately a part owner in. And it, it seems that when he came in, he came in really as chief executive officer, general manager, and, and he basically ran the place. And so um, during that time, uh, he got involved, or their company got involved with, uh, with Bell Aircraft, and he became fascinated with the manufacturing problems surrounding making airplane wings. And you see in this diagram, we're, we're looking at the critical pieces that he got involved in, which were the front and rear spars of the wing. He also got involved in uh, a piece of equipment that would allow you on, on a scaled basis to, uh, for, the, for any sized airplane to cre create the rolled edge of metal that goes around the, and sheathes the airplane wing. And then he also did some things that had to do with riveting, setting rivet, rivets. And these were all um, uh, cutting edge new technologies um, that he got involved in, and at that and and out of this, um, he was able to take airplane manufacturing from basically a thousand hours to build the spars for um, uh, for an airplane wing, a thousand hours to thirteen. Paul Dubasclard, prior to World War II, created the technology that allowed all aircraft built during World War II to have these super fast builds. Um, this is a picture uh, in 1939 of Douglas Aircraft Plant in, in Santa Monica, California. And we don't know which wings these are. These are probably dauntless bomber wings. Um, and, uh, but it, we don't know it for a fact, but it's extremely likely at this point in time, all these wings are being made with Duvaclar's um, uh, technology. And, uh, uh, and like I said, this is scalable, which means that this piece of equipment literally could, could make a wing 20 feet long and could make a, a wing 100 feet long. So all you had to do was dial it in. And, um, and the US government, uh, when the war started, gave him uh, basically pointed to Paul Dubasclard and Farnham slash Paragon uh, as the primary source 
for, uh, for the designs of this specific manufacturing equipment that would allow the aircraft manufacturers to make these wings in 13 hours. And um, so during World War II, of course, we have some very famous aircraft. And, and uh, my, my understanding is that all these planes uh, utilized his, his technology. Um, wow. And so Paul Dubaclar in during World War II was a significant uh, technological player and, um, and probably the, the first time the US government actually uh, makes the information available is in, in 1943, where there was an article that was printed in every major newspaper in the United States that discussed his technologies and, and exactly what that did for the war effort and being able to build these planes faster than anybody else in the world. Um, so in 1943, Paul, living in, in uh, Buffalo, New York, and still and married to his wife, Olga Dimitrov, who is now Olga Dubasklar, Dubaklar, um, he meets this beautiful young woman, uh, Edith Feeney. She's 22 years old when he's 51 years old, and they um, uh, have a child together. And uh, I think conceived in uh, December of 1943 or thereabouts and born in, you know, a little bit later. So, um, so this is Phyllis Dubaclar. And um, uh, she uh, is really the source of some of the information, some of the best information I had about Paul and the history. And, um, and she wrote a letter which was given to the Topanga Historical Society that uh, basically outlined this whole situation and allowed me to kind of dive into this project with something to research. Um, this is a picture of Paul, probably about 1960. We only have several fixed pictures so far of Paul, one from the 70s and one from the 60s. Um, so, you know, he does this artwork, uh, most of which today um, are serographs. And so the, really the question here, most people may not understand exactly what a serograph is, uh, we understand it as being a silk screen. That's another terminology. And the technology or the, 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 the process is in silk screening, you take silk, you lay it over a frame. You can see a frame here. This frame is turned upside down. You adhere it to the sides of the frame. And then you basically layer the uh, silk in a certain kind of a glue. And then once the glue is dry, you cover, come up on top of that with a material called touche, which you, you put on with a paintbrush and you can actually draw the image on. So you can artistically create the image. After you've laid on the touche on top of the glue, the, the, the end result is then dipped in, to, the, to my understanding, is kerosene. And, um, and that chemical reaction basically allows the area where the touche was to make the, the screen clear of material, so so you end up now having the design. Uh, you can pass ink through the design on the screen, and so then what you do is, of course, you take that and you turn it upside down and you apply with a squeegee um, ink. So um, in this instance, you see a single color green, but um, in in what Paul was doing, uh, he was doing between four and 10, possibly 11 colors on a postcard size piece of paper, um, which is very difficult. And the quality of the images he was putting together were it was very, very high. What are you trying um, to do? Trying to do them here. We'll have to turn Apple TV on first. I'm sorry? <clears throat> um, so, uh, so with regard, so Paul, um, predominantly well in, uh, all is well in recovery. Hold on a moment, please. I think that's probably got it. Okay. Um, so, um, Paul, so Paul's pieces um, are done in this process at the time. It was very. It was a very difficult, chemical laden, very a lot of solvents, and and pretty awful to do on a daily basis and on ongoing basis. And so um, I, I consulted with with various 
um, expert um, silk screeners and uh, woodblock printers who have significant experience. And they said that the process as it was done at this time was, was pretty detailed and difficult. And so what he was doing was really a, a true labor of love. So, um, so the, the postcards that Paul Dubaclar did are generally identified um, with, with him by his signature. Our understanding is that the first one that was done is this stamp signature, which would have been stamped at the bottom corner of the card. Then after this, I think because this was a little bit uglier of a process and you could put the thing in slightly sideways or you know, miss stamp it, he uh, purchased a, an embossing stamp. This is PM, his middle initials are Pierre Michael. Um, and so he had the PM done and he used that for quite a long time. And then the last card that we know of that had a different um, uh, signature was done in 1959 for the state of Hawaii card. And he did this, this is actually a silk screen piece. You see, these are hand stamps and this is what actually silk screened on. And then recently in my research, I was able to locate a Paul Dubaclar um, uh, oil painting, uh, which is quite beautiful. And, um, and this is his signature on oil painting. So, and you can see it's fairly similar to what he did in the earlier um, hand stamp. So the postcards, if you flip them over, uh, can be identified a couple of different ways. Almost all of the cards say published by M.A. Sheehan, Topanga, California. Uh, Margaret Sheehan was uh, a woman who was the sister of, of Edith Feeney, who came out with Paul and Phyllis uh, when they came out from, um, from um, uh, Buffalo in, 19, in 1945. Um, and so, uh, I think that Paul probably ended up having an agreement with her where she got involved in the distribution and the marketing for the cards. And that's why she's listed as publisher. Now we have another card here that says Oka Stewart. The Oka Stewart cards are really quite rare and we, we have very few examples of them. Uh, Oka was a, a significant person in the canyon, was involved in, in Camp Wildwood and a bunch of other things which you all know about. Um, and he was quite a character. Um, but I think that when Paul first came into the canyon, he probably found that Oka had the time to help him market these cards. And so the first set of cards that were marketed were done under Oka. Um, later on, Paul also did uh, collections of, of cards. There were three collections. One was the state flags for all the states. And then he did US presidents. And then he did the Zodiac. And these can all be identified on the back by this uh, uh, setup, which includes his PM uh, monogram, um, you know, handmade original serigraph, approved by the card, uh, the Postcard Collectors Club of America, and then the limited edition number uh, in, in, and information. So you'll find on the internet, you can find these cards. Sometimes they're numbered and sometimes they're not. Um, the highest number we generally find in any of the sets like this is in the high 300s. I've never seen anything higher, although maybe it exists. <laughs> so Paul um, really did some beautiful images. And you can see in, in, this, in this show, I'll provide you with original historic postcards that either were, were, at, were prior to Paul coming to the canyon or just during that period. So here's a card called Approaching Storm Topanga. And I think Paul probably saw this card. It was very common in all the postcard stores. And I think that he said, oh, I can do one, but it'll be a beautiful piece. And of course, here it is. It's fabulous, very rare, uh, really great card. Uh, sometimes it'll be signed, sometimes it's unsigned. You can see uh, right here, Paul's PM stamp, which is relatively rare even on these cars, cards. Um, uh, most of the cards do not have the inset text, which we, you, you'd see here, like Topanga, California. So this is Oka Stewart, uh, and you can see that Oka is a, I, I really want to know Oka. I wish Oka could come back and we could all have a beer together. What a great guy. 
Um, and uh, th these are two cards that were done. This is an Oka Stewart card. And one thing about the Oka Stewart, and keep in mind, Oka did not do the art. It's just that he was he was listed on the back as the as the publisher. So, but at that time when Paul did these cards, so these cards are a little bit more impressionistic. You'll notice that you know this one has more finer detail in the foreground, and this one just looks a little rougher. I think I prefer this one. I think it's more interesting looking. We also see that the the inset text on the side appears to be handmade, which I think it was for every one of these cards, he would actually redo this text Did right here. Did you have a wonderful time? Um, you have we, a we can hear time. you, we can hear you talking, Did sir. you? Oh, good. Somebody but needs to mute. Somebody needs to mute. Oh, hold on, hold on. oh I am on mute, yes. Mute. mute. Okay, sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, Okay, so these are the Oka Stewart cards. And what you see here is the rarest of the rare. This is an uncut, complete sheet of postcards. Now keep in mind that he did these cards on a single sheet. The, all the colors had to be coordinated. So you got all the effects on these cards by hand spreading the ink. So how do you get, you know, again, this medium purple when it's not in any of the other cards or maybe it is but i don't see it i mean it's it's really quite a difficult task to do what he did here and um and this is what all the oka stewart cards look like um and again you can generally identify them by this more rough hand lettered topanga california and if you if you generally compare card to card even on this single sheet you'll notice that every one of these is hand hand uh, lettered. Uh, it's not like somebody used a stamp and did this one and this one and this one and this one. He hand lettered all of this and then laid in, you know, all these colors and, and the perimeter borders and all that. It's really quite a, quite a feat. Um, this is an image called Spring Grade. Um, here's a, a, a contemporary postcard showing that area of the Upper Malibu, or I'm sorry, Upper Topanga Canyon. And you can see these two cards here. Notice that this card is, it, this, the, the, the paper is the same size, but the image is different. And back then in the mid-1940s, because all these cards, to the best of my knowledge, almost categorically are done between 45 and 49, okay? 1945 to 1949. And so, for example, these two cards are actually different. This is a smaller image. There is no electronic scaling. So he had to do this card um, separately. He had to do the screens, all eight screens separately. All of these screens are separate. Um, of course, this has inset text on it, has a different color border. You can see that this one is, has the uh, uh, penciled uh, uh, title. This one has a text title, uh, inset text here, and then, of course, his stamp. And it's beautiful. And these scale, you can increase these in size and they just retain their beauty, even though in the originals, they're only about five inches tall. Um, this is a winter in Fernwood. You can see the title here. here. This is an Oka Stewart version. You can see in these three cards that these are all, again, these are all separate. They look the same, but when you look, start looking at the details, you'll notice that this is all different. All these screens that were made for each one of these cards is totally different. So it's unclear how many cards he made. It's unclear how many times he reprinted these. The screens don't last forever, um, so they can fail after a while, but you should be able to get a couple of thousand out of a screen. So, um, you know, he again, this one was done while Oka was in charge, and then this one was done a little later. These two were done a little later. But beautiful. Um, this is Christmas holly, and um, what you you know these look almost totally identical. But again, you can see in the structure that the roof is different. How the ink is done on the roof is different. The coloring is different. And then when you look at the hillsides and how things are cut out, it is in fact all different. These are different screens uh, laid up at a different time. So you can imagine him saying oh, you know, I just, you know, maybe ruined the last set of screens for Christmas holly and people want a bunch of these. Let's go ahead and make some more. So he'd have to recreate it all, all 
10 screens. So, okay, this one is called Sunset Over the Pacific. It's interesting because it's a, it's a pretty um, casual image. It's, it's, it's not particularly crisp. I do like it, um, but it's interesting because of how much you know, variety he got out of his use of colors, the addition of some, some other features, and then of course, how he addressed the sandy area in the foreground and the clouds. You know, you can see um, that these, all these clouds, they're all different, but, but he was an expert at doing these things, you know, uh, over and over again. Uh, this one is Evening Fog. Uh, this utilizes, uh, like so many of his cards, um, a technique called split fountain. And in split fountain, in, instead of getting a single color, like you can see here, this is all the same color in this particular area. This is the same color. This appears to be the same color. Right here, you can see this gradient of different blues and whites mixed together. And what they do is, is Paul uh, mixed blue and white at the edge of the screen and mixed them in a certain way. And then he pulled the, uh, the squeegee across the screen in order to get the effect. So in a Oka Stewart card, this is a, he didn't use this effect very much and, and, the, and it wasn't as skillful, but in the later cards, he gets a much more skillful effect. And you can see here, we have this sense of haze and fog up the canyon. Uh, it's very effective. And, um, and artistically and masterfully done. Uh, this is Sycamore Lodge. Um, again, these two cards are in fact completely different cuts. You can see like this one has this plant right here. It doesn't over here, although you can see something maybe in the background. You'll notice you start to see these um, uh, copyright symbols. He starts using these probably in the late forties. I think he probably started realizing that he was concerned about people knocking these off. Um, so, you know, this one again is it has is titled and it has inset text for Topanga. This one doesn't. Um, uh, this is Pine Tree Circle, also known as North Canyon. So you can see this one's called North Canyon. The if you turn over the Oka Stewart versions, the title for the Oka Stewart card is on the backside in printed text. So Oka Stewart will always have the title on the back. There will never be any text up front that says the, the name of the image. So, um, and you can see again, his early use of Split Fountain. You can see a little bit of it here and a, a better effect here to get that sky to, to haze feeling. This is, um, Richard Dix's house. Richard Dix was a famous movie star, silent and sound film from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. He had a home at the top of the canyon, which was torn down in 1978. Uh, this is of that house, of those grounds at that time. I think that Paul was trying to meet the tourist demand for cards that dealt with movie star homes. And you'll see that, again, these cards are different. The, the card size is the same, but the image is larger in this one. The earlier Oka Stewart version is smaller. You can see the tree is similar but different. And, er, and the more you look at it, the more differences you'll find, uh, how the texture is done on the side of the structure, et cetera. Um, this is a particularly beautiful image, however you find it. Uh, this is called Topanga Poplars. Um, and the only time we know, knew of the name, I've never seen one that is that has an, uh, a title on it, except for the Oka Stewart card. So if you turn over this Oka Stewart card, you'll see Topanga Pop Poplars on the back. You can see how he played with the colors in different, in different editions of this print. So this is a totally different set of screens from this, and of course, different colors. And he tried to get a, a a little bit more density of the cliff face here. Didn't really see it as much here. You can see some of it here uh, in a kind of a more interesting impressionistic sense. Uh, these are cards that all relate specifically to Malibu. This is the Malibu car courthouse on the mountain side of the Pacific Coast Highway. Many of us are familiar with this structure up until it was painted, I believe, in recent years, white. Um, you know, this original uh, structure has a, more, a style of mortar between the bricks that squashes out. It's a beautiful um, architectural masterpiece, but Paul saw it and loved it. So he did these, you'll see courthouse on this side of the card, other versions, you'll see it on this side of the card. There are very, a whole variety of, of 
of subtle variations between the cards. Um, this is uh, uh, what I call Surf Riders. We don't know what Paul called this card, but I call it Surf Riders. And it's fun and interesting, and we've only ever seen one of them. Uh, this, there are a whole series of these cards that are Port of Malibu, California. You'll sometimes see them only with Port of, as though if you're the, the, the person who's sending the, the um, postcard, you can maybe write in your own port, like Santa Monica or Port of Topanga or whatever. Uh, you can see that in this particular card, he uses a split fountain to great effect to get the sunset. Here it's to much more subtle effect. Um, here are the Santa Monica cards. We have the Canon, which is the first one I ever found and I thought was particularly beautiful. Um, uh, this is St. Monica's Church in Santa Monica. Uh, although you do find subtle variations in some of these cards, meaning that he did in fact have different editions of these. They're, these Santa Monica cards generally are of extremely tight production and it's very difficult to discern the differences. Um, small boat landing in Santa Monica. This is Santa Monica Pier. This image is particularly beautiful if you really focus in on the image itself. I think that the color wasn't that great, the background color of the card, um, but the image itself is particularly striking and beautiful. If it was a full-size oil painting, um, you, pro you probably wouldn't, wouldn't think twice it was in a museum at full scale. Um, as an oil painting. So this is a Santa Monica Public Library. This image was actually taken by Paul from a photograph done in 1927 of the original structure. And you can tell us the original photograph because Paul exactly copies all of the bushes and the, even down to the shadows. So it's really interesting he, what he was using to create the fodder for some of his cards. This is a Santa Monica City Hall. And there are a variety of other cards out there that are, at, that are actual photographs, but Paul decided again to do a serograph uh, to, to get you know, some of that great um, uh, subtle interest in the architecture. Uh, this is Santa Barbara. This is all Santa Barbara mission. You can see an original postcard here that shows you the image. It's unclear as to whether Paul actually took this card and just did this image or he went up there, he, you know, because of course you can go up there today and stand right where I'm, where this is posted right here. And you can take this image yourself with a camera or whatever. Now you can see that he uses a little bit of split fountain, a couple of different effects. Very, all these are very beautiful in their different forms. They all look different. Some of them will say Santa Barbara um, you, uh, uh, mission. Um, and, uh, uh, or you'll see some that say uh, queen of the missions. Uh, this is El Paseo de la Guerra up in Santa Barbara. It's a place you can visit. You could visit in 1940, which is when this was done. And I think, again, this is where Paul, you know, saw this. Uh, you can see this, the Bogovia is the same, although this uh, juniper is in, in that image. Uh, but it's a particularly beautiful image, very striking. And, um, and this image and a bunch like it are related to the uh, Santa Barbara Fiesta Days Festival. Um, and he was very interested in that, um, and, and he was interested in Santa Barbara, so he did a variety of cards. This is the courthouse in Santa Barbara. Probably he either took, did this image in person uh, before he took it down and created cards out of it, or he maybe used this, this postcard to copy it, um, but he artistically, I think he did a fabulous job on this image. This is an, a nighttime virgin, version, courthouse by moonlight. Uh, he was, you know, Catholic, and he was interested in the saints, and so I think that he keyed in on Saint Mo Santa Monica and Santa Barbara, and so he did these in tribute to to those saints. Um, and uh, this is, you know, this variation here is the primary one you see the color of the background cardstock, and this one there's more of a black background, and then you have this one with a kind of a purplish background. Very attractive card. There's beautiful silver detail in them and gold. These are the cards that really come out of the Fiesta Days for Santa Barbara. Um, and you can see, I've tried to collect here examples that had the most interest to them. Uh, uh, signatures, uh, whether by hand signature or, um, you know, or not, I'm sorry, hand stamp or by embossed. And then we have inset text. You can see there are variations. There's 
Malibu, California, Santa Barbara, you know, Santa Barbara, all that. Uh, this is um, uh, San Francisco to Assis. Uh, generally, you find these without any other text on them. Uh, this is Don Jose, and this is El, the Paseo de, de la Guerra. These are all beautiful cards and interesting. They've got e details that don't come through in these photographs, but there are background, uh, there's very subtle background detail uh, that's kind of interesting to look at if you have a card in your hands. Like right here, you can see there are actually adobes in the background. Uh, there are hills, bushes, houses with wrought iron railings, but it, it really is a subtle effect. Uh, he did these. Uh, these all have the name Remuda Rider or Fiesta Rider. So you can find the men in your Remuda Rider or Fiesta Rider or the women. This is the only card that we've ever found for the female side that has anything other than the black dress. Uh, and you, again, you find them with the, um, the title, without the title, with inset text or without it. Um, this is an interesting image because uh, first of all, it's Malibu. There's, you know, it's um, it's kind of interesting here. It's fun, and then uh, what's particularly interesting is that he was a true artist. He probably had a large art library, and in I researched this image, and I have a feeling that it, it's this oil painting that he used as the basis to create this image. The the, the female form, how she's laying, the the hair, how it spills out, the arms, etc. It's really an interesting comparison. Um, he did a couple of sailboats. These, these are the only two sailboat images, uh, particularly beautiful, uh, this one. Um, and, there's, and there are variations with and without inset text, uh, no titles, um, uh, but these can vary in color from a, uh, you know, kind of a sunset or sunrise on the ocean to uh, almost dark. Um, he did these card sets, and I've only provided you with a limited number of these here, but here's the Zodiac set, 12 done in this style. Um, there are some variations in these cards. Some of them have the ecliptic laid out. He was very interested in astronomy. I think he was very technically proficient in understanding astronomy and, um, and uh, though that kind of science. So he had a lot of fun with this. So there are 12 of these. And, um, and you can find these both uh, in the numbered sets. And in some cases, you can find these as just straight postcards on a one-off basis without regard to limited edition sets. This is the state flag sets, 48 states. Um, uh, you, know, you can find the collections online occasionally. This is the president set um, and uh, 30, uh, 32 presidents up to Truman. Um, and then this is the Hawaii state flag uh, card that was done in 1959. And what's partially interesting about this, and I, I probably missed a little bit of the history of Margaret Sheehan, but she, she came with him to Topanga Canyon in 1945, and she passed away in 1949 of pneumonia um, uh, and uh, was 42 at the time. But I, I think that she was involved in the you know, publishing of these cards for that entire period. But this particular card, if you, if you flip it over, it says published by M.A. Sheehan. So I think that he did this as a tribute to Margaret. Um, and I have found very few of these cards that are, um, uh, have a postal stamp on it, uh, canceling. Uh, and in those cases, you see dates uh, ranging back into the 50s. I, I've only ever found two or three of these with postmarks. I think most people held on to all these cards um, uh, as collectibles as opposed to uh, sending them the mail. So while I was doing the research on this project, um, I located on eBay this 33-inch uh, oil painting by Paul Dubosclar. Dubos, Dubo Clar. Um, and I've got it right there. Uh, I love it. And, um, and it's really a fabulous thing. So I'm happy that I found it. Um, this uh, poster was found to be in the collection of the uh, Topanga Historical Society and it, they just lost track of it. And, um, and we, in having a conversation with Pablo, he talked to some members of the, of the association or the uh, society 
And they mentioned that Paul had come in and donated these posters, hard to say, 60s or 70s, early 70s. Paul died in 1974. Um, but the, the, the association has four of these, which is, shows a minor in this uh, very austere desert background. These were added just in the last few days. Um, these are Christmas cards that Paul did. Um, and, and, you know, again, the, these are uh, serographs. And, you know, even at this level, e even though these look the same, the, not the cards themselves, but this particular uh, piece in the cards, the, he redid every one of these every time he did these cards. I'm not quite sure why he did. He just must have thrown away the original. But he, but they're very close. But if you examine them, you know, look up close, you'll see that they are in fact done differently. So that's again, these are all unique pieces of art. And um, uh, so, and this was uh, donated by uh, Ann Ann Barrett, who was a friend of the family, uh, along with Ann Barrett and uh, Jim, uh, their brother, and uh, Jim had a significant relationship with Paul Dubasclard as an, as an art, artistic student. And um, in my book, I have uh, some more information that relates to, to information that Jim Barrett provided um, that's very interesting and gives us a very nice insight into Paul and his life. Uh, these are some more of these cards that were done, uh, some nudes. And then this is a uh, coat of arms that was made for the Barrett family. This is Paul and Edith in about 1970. And um, uh, this is a photo that was done by Paul. I have a feeling that Paul was a fabulous photographer, as you can see from this photo. This is, was done in Topanga Canyon during a light snowfall. Uh, it's particularly beautiful. Um, and uh, that is it. I want to thank everybody for coming and, and listening, and I hope you put your thinking caps on and look around a little bit. If, if anybody here knew the Dubuclars, uh, uh, or if you have any of these images, if you're aware of any of all Paul's other artworks, oil paintings, um, uh, mini figural studies, um, graphite, graphic drawings, um, uh, pencil drawings. He did a lot of things, but most of it, uh, according to the, to the Barrett's and information that Jim provided, Jim Barrett, um, uh, when, when uh, Edith passed away in 1994 uh, or so, she had all this art stacked up in the, in, their, um, in the studio above Paul's garage and next to the pool up in Brentwood. And we don't know what happened to any of this stuff uh, after she passed away. And I think that probably the oil painting that I found may have come from that, uh, that you know, collection, maybe, I don't know. But um, uh, if anybody knows anything, please give me a call. And you can contact me if you want to through the um, Topanga Historical Society. Thank you to the Topanga Historical so Society. That's it. Uh, thank you, John. I think that was an amazing program. And that's a person that I had not come to my attention before. And that we're very appreciative that you've done such deep research because it's really wonderful art and it's a wonderful history. Uh, in speaking to you previously, you said something about the, that I was very interesting about Linus Pauling and his connection oh, with the family. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I missed that piece. And if, have we got a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. Okay. So very... I, Thank you. Very interesting side piece here. Okay, so I, I think some of you probably recognize that what what happened to the wife? What happened to Olga Dubisclard? Okay, and so um, uh, Olga and Paul were married in 1919, and they, as much as I understand, lived together at least until he left uh, Buffalo in 1943. Um, the next thing, and of course, Paul uh, did in fact marry Edith. Um, in 1952, after his, di his divorce from Olga. And we do know that Olga was in Southern California and living possibly under the trees in Topanga Canyon. We're not really quite sure where the story goes there, but she um, uh, was, was, I think, an extremely bright, articulate uh, person 
who was like Paul in, in you know, it being kind of a genius level type. And, um, but she went off in a direction that was a little bit hard, I think, for Paul to deal with. And he ultimately divorced her. And we find out about Olga afterwards, predominantly in a couple of ways. One was there was a, um, uh, a gossip rag in Los Angeles, or at least there was a gossip column in the LA Mirror back in the early 50s, uh, mid 50s. And the person who wrote that this series of articles, he wrote about Olga Duvisclard twice. And one time he had actually seen her on, on um, Sunset Boulevard up by UCLA. And she seemed out of context, walking along with a cane, dressed kind of fancy. And, and he stopped and said, can I help you? Can I give you a ride? And so he did, and she accepted that, but he got her story. And so she told this somewhat outrageous story about her husband who was dead to her and some other things like that. Uh, and, and then he encountered her, I think uh, a year later and picked her up again and interviewed her again. And there was another article about, about you know, this is the, you know, the update to <laughs> Olga Dubasclard. And, um, and so uh, it turns out that Olga was living as best we understand at the, at the uh, and correct me if I get this wrong, the uh, fellowship, you know, up on Sunset Boulevard, there's the, there's the um, uh, fellowship uh, at the big curve just above, the, uh, above uh, Highway 1, where the self-realization. Uh, Self-realization. Yeah. Thank you very much. So she lived there, or at least that was her postal address. And while she was there, she was um, conversing through uh, the mail with Linus Pauling. And if you go into the Linus Pauling, there's a collection online that everything that he ever wrote or whatever, and ever in all of his letters. And so here are all these letters from uh, from Olga Dubasclard discussing in 1955 um, the effect of, uh, of, of the nuclear bomb fallout on the polar ice caps, the melting of polar ice caps effects on weather and climate. Um, and she and he got in, uh, into this conversation back and forth. I'm not sure how many letters there were, but there were enough where, and he was responding legitimately to her thoughts and theories and concepts. Um, and then she also was in touch with a famous sociologist who started the uh, Department of Sociology at Harvard, whose name, if it may escape me at the moment, um, uh, but he's famous, he's, uh, uh, but anyway, so they were both Russian. Olga was Russian, this guy was Russian, uh, Sorokin, his name is Sorokin. And um, he, he is, he's listed as being one of the top, let's see, well, I, I'll, I'll stop on that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm walking off track here. But anyway, so she was also talking to him about social theories and, um, and, and he was legitimately res responding to her and they had a, quite a uh, uh, back and forth in letter form, all of which you can read online. So she was a significant person in her own right. I think we need to ref we need to recognize that 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 they were probably quite a quite a pair when they were, you know, as you can imagine. So uh, and so and and in 1965 or so, there was an article <clears throat> in the Indianapolis Star oh, about Olga Dubasclard. I'm sorry, there's somebody talking in the background. Let me finish this up and then you can chat. Um, uh, there was uh, oh, this article last minute. Oh, hold on a second. Potluck. Please mute. I was trying to. Okay, I think I got muted. Um, uh, Indianapolis Star, and um, that, uh, that Olga had become some kind of an expert on beatniks. And, and so she was interviewed about beatniks, and she, she brought in Woodrow Wilson as being the father of the beatniks, and she actually had a concept behind that. And... Um, and, uh, you know, the article was kind of interesting. So, um, so she, yeah, she was quite a, pe a person. Um, so thank you, Ed. I, I appreciate you reminding me of that. And then there we are. I, did, um, I could unmute and uh, let's see. Could, could, let's see. I'm not sure how to do this, Ed. If, I, if people there have questions. May, there may be a way for you to unmute all. But anybody who wants to speak at this point, I think, 
uh, can unmute themselves if you have a question or something to add. I just had a question about, this is absolutely the most incredible presentation. Thank you so much. It's just amazing what you've done and the research and everything else on this. Fascinating. Um, I was wondering in terms of the, um, the actual craft. So Paul did all of the designs and the um, painting sort of as, so to speak, for the, um, the postcards and everything that we've seen tonight. And then did Oka, who by the way, I met back in the seventies and he was quite a character. I'd always heard that uh, Oka came from the circus. That's where he um, came from before he came to Topanga. I um, think that falls right in line. <laughs> yeah, he used to do, I used to see him do high dives off that uh, swimming pool, off the high dive pool there um, that they had at their at, at Camp Wildwood. He was um, quite the character back in the 70s too. Anyway, um, so I was just wondering in terms of the process, uh, did he do all of the actual visual uh, the layering, you know, the, 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 the print make, he, you say that Oka was the publisher, but, but Oka yeah, was not the artist. I, I, Paul you know, the this, artist. Is, this is part of what makes a story interesting. Um, or another thing that makes a story interesting is because, um, you know, Paul was really a great artist. And in, if you look at the, at the, if you look at the sets, the card sets that he did, like, um, um, you know, Zodiac, etc. Um, he says, you know, that each one of those has a little cover letter in it. And he says in each one of them, he talks about the progress of the, or the, the concept of serography and that the nature of it is that the artist does the work. He does everything. It, that is the nature of it. Okay. And that this is handmade by the artist. He made that point. Now we don't have specific information uh, from, from him making an, a statement otherwise about anything else he did. But if you look at the process um, uh, to create these cards, uh, one of the problems when you're doing woodblock prints and serographs is something called registration. And what that is, is that as you do the colors, each color has to overlap with the last color in such a way that it, it completes the effect that you're trying to accomplish. If you don't line them up properly, then you'll end up exposing um, a, a card color underneath or not getting quite the, the, the right. image. And, right. and so to get everything laid in properly, when you're talking about uh, six, to ten, six to 11 colors, it's really quite a thing to do. Also, um, now you'll notice in the, if we went back to that Oka Stewart card, okay, let me do that. And because it, it kind of, yeah, hold on a second. I can get this to cooperate with me. Um, the, the thing that you see in the Oka Stewart cards is that he made the decision to do all these different cards on one piece of cardstock. That makes the whole thing very complex. Um, and it also limits, I, th I think it limits the, because you have to, you're kind of limited to the number of colors you can use across all the cards. So, um, so in other words, that if you did all 10, if you did all 10 cards on that one piece of card stock, like he did, I'm sorry, I'm still not back where I should be. It's, I'm having trouble getting my pointer to roll me back here. Um, we're getting some progress. A lot of material, isn't there? There it is. Go forward and bang, bang. Okay, so this one card here, the master sheet, to print all these, you had to be able to utilize the screening process, the same inks to do everything on this card. And that's really difficult if you look at it. Absolutely, um, yeah. It's and amazing. So the, the person who's doing this is an artist. It's not a lay person. This is not something that you can say, you know, to your 15 year old son, why don't you come in here and knock off a hundred of these. The, the process is extremely exacting. Um, everything has to be laid in properly, lined up um, over and over and over again. The process itself is chemical fumes, terrible chemical fumes. Um, it really requires um, dedication 
and patience, which is, you know, Paul Dubas Clar was, you know, as a mechanical engineer, um, was one of those people who can focus and, and can visualize, realize anything he can put in his mind. And so he's the kind of person who can do this type of thing. And I think that, um, so I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but. Um, no, I don't think you are. <laughs> but I, I, I so appreciate what you're saying because <laughs> this is, it, it exactly ties in. I mean, he has this genius mechanical engineering capability. Yeah. And then it's absolutely, you're this, correct in terms of reflected in the, in this multiple layering and. Yeah, this chemicals. guy mechanically, yeah. He can yeah. create machinery to do anything you can imagine. He himself, he, he was so critical to the process when he was at Farnham that he left the presidency to work on the floor overseeing all the other engineers to make sure that all the designs came through in the ultimate piece of equipment that was being cranked out by Farnham, okay? Um, and uh, and so, um, so I think that you know, if you look at the statement he made in the card sets, if you look at the difficulty of the process and, and the artistic nature of this, um, there's no doubt in my mind that he's the artist um, and that the publisher, it's like, let's think about what a publisher is if you think about, about a book. Did, 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 you know, whoever it is, Doubleday. Did Doubleday actually write Tom Sawyer or did, did Mark Twain or Samuel Clemens? And it's like, no, the, you know, the publisher is the publisher. They, they basically facilitated the marketing and, and, the, and coordinated the printing and stuff. Of course, a publisher prints a book. In this case, I don't think these publishers printed these. These publishers coordinated with the local, uh, uh, you know, again, this is before, and remember, before the internet, practically before, you know, any of this electronic stuff and, and difficult telephone communications and all that kind of stuff, they probably had to go spend their times going shop to shop to shop, you know, requesting orders, showing new exactly. products and all that. So I think that's what Margaret Sheehan was doing. I think that she was traveling up and down the coast from Santa Barbara to Santa Monica, going to every shop personally until they got enough of a business going where people would say, you know, they'd write a letter and they remember a letter. They wrote a letter and it ended up in <laughs> Topanga Canyon and said, we would like a hundred more um, you know, clouds over Topanga, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's- So Oka was basically a publisher on the cards that Oka did. And, and he was- And was a publisher, yeah. Because right. somebody had okay. to be doing the art and printing this stuff. No, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't imagine that, but I was just trying to get the distinct- No, I, I know. And, and yeah. it raises a really good question, but I think, you know, I that's why here in Denver, um, um, I, I contacted this- um, expert lithographer and and water and I'm sorry um and woodblock printer who's known nationally and he actually sat down with him and showed him all this stuff and he was very impressed and when I showed him this card here with all these on it he said master 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 so yeah absolutely a master and just one quick question um I I'll, I, I guess I could maybe find it in the in the uh, chronicle the the newspaper's uh, article um which I read but you said that you have a book about this and the, yes. with this collection so, and so is there is there just a quick note on how we would get that book yeah um uh you know the book um it depends upon how much more information comes in in the next couple of weeks but i think you know the book is predominantly done um and it's you know it's not going to be a, a a formally published thing although i'm going to make it look pretty nice um, you know, it's going to be distributed to uh, some of the local uh, national libraries. Um, I've already. Well, you'll have to, to put it in the Topanga Library. Oh for sure. no! Yeah, I mean, okay. and local and some of the local museums. Because the fact of the matter is, this this guy, this guy, not only is a great artist, but he he is important to the history yes. of you know, World War II. And oh yeah! Ho holy moly! You know what a guy! <laughs> what yeah, a it's amazing. You know, well, I, I, the, I, I mentioned in the chat that my father flew the B something bombers during um, World are. War II in the South Pacific yeah. uh, arena. And, um, I, and when you were talking about, you know, the wings and the mechanic and yeah. engineering that he put into all of these and then making them 13 hours instead of weeks, um, 
it just put it all in perspective. And I and I I made a note there just to yeah, in the chat. I, I think he's <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for saving historic. my father's yeah, life. I think he's an important historic figure. Um, yeah. And he was just kind of lost um, because you know he became wealthy out of his ownership. He was a fifty percent, fifty five percent owner in Paragon, Paragon and and Farnham. Um, and I don't know how you know much he had, but he was independently wealthy. He could do whatever he wanted. And I think that he was, you know, basically kind of supporting, you know, his, you know, he's probably supporting his wife. He was supporting his, his to be wife and his daughter and Margaret Sheehan and doing all this stuff. And, oh, he was also a big traveler, went back and forth to Europe. Uh, several many times I think actually but we, we we can actually document at least four or five trips back and forth across the Atlantic um and 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 Phyllis Dubasclard talks about these fabulous trips to Paris and blah 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 so I think it you know there was a life here that was amazing from you know all these tragic things that happened to him and then all these wonderful things and then coming to you know, this, I, this idyllic life in the, you can imagine 1945 in the Topanga Canyon, just after the war where people are giddy and he's landed, so to speak, in the canyon and things are good and, and money is flowing and people are happy and Oka has a big swimming pool, you know? Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think it was, uh, it was really quite a, quite a thing. I think, I think, you know, if there's, if there's a, if there's some kind of a movie guy out there, I think there's a story here. I think that, you know, this is one of those stories like hidden figures where, you know, it's the people behind the people. Um, and there's certainly enough with Linus Pauling and, all, you know, there's stuff in here. It's fun. No, it's fascinating. I agree. Thank you so much. This is You're just welcome. wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions? If, if, if anybody wants to unmute or otherwise, uh, it's it, it's it's been fun. Thank you very much. It's been fantastic, and thanks for the the program was really a stellar program. Oh, let, let me answer. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one other thing. Uh, you know, my name is John Brewer. My email address is John A Brewer at msn.com. John J O H N A is an apple. B R E W E R at marysamnancy.com. And you know, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book. Um, then, you know, once it's done, just email me uh, and I'd be happy to put you on the list. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to be a limited production thing. I'm not trying to make any money off of this, but I, I, but I have to cover printing costs. <laughs> well, please let us know, Paul, when you do have it out and we'll send a little thing to our membership. Okay, that sounds great. Well, everyone have a wonderful night. Thanks so much to you, John, and everybody who attended tonight. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Thank you, Historical Good night. Society. Good night. Thank you, Thanks, everybody.